In front of me, I have five of the hardest exams in the world. Some of these exams take years to prepare for and others you can't prepare for. Some of them test your pure knowledge while others test your creative and original thinking. And one of these exams, the one that I'm most excited to talk about at the end of this video, has a median score of zero. In this video, we're gonna dive into each of these exams and what makes them so special. We're gonna look at the structure of these exams, the kinds of questions that are on them and how students tend to do. First up on our list is the USMLE, the United States Medical Licensing Examinations. Now I got stressed just reading about this one. If you're one of my viewers who plans to become a doctor one day, I applaud you because it is not an easy process. The USMLE is a three-step examination for medical licensure in the US. In other words, it's what you need to take in order to become a doctor. Now the USMLE is different from the MCAT. The MCAT is what you take to get into medical school. The USMLE is what you take after you get into medical school. And technically this exam takes years to complete because you don't take it all at once. It consists of three stages or steps as they call it. Most students will complete step one, which covers basic science knowledge at the end of their second year in medical school. They'll take step two, which covers clinical knowledge during their fourth year in medical school. And they'll take step three, which covers patient management after they graduate, usually during their first year in residency. Each of these steps is a very intense and lengthy exam. Step one is an eight hour exam that consists of 280 multiple choice questions covering topics like anatomy, biochemistry, microbiology, and many other areas. If you're in high school, I want you to simply imagine spending the entire school day taking the most intense exam of your life. Got that? Cool. Now add one hour because step two is a nine hour exam that consists of 318 multiple choice questions. Oh, and in step two, we're not dealing with basic science concepts anymore. Now we're getting asked about things like internal medicine, surgery, and pediatrics. Now, if you're feeling tired, I need you to stay awake because step three is an 18 hour exam that you take over the course of two days. Step three is all about applying your medical knowledge in the real world. It consists of 412 multiple choice questions and 13 computer-based simulations to walk you through different patient scenarios. Let's look at some sample questions. So this packet right here contains sample questions for step one. And what you'll immediately notice is that these questions are long. I don't think I've seen a multiple choice question this long in my life. So this question right here asks you about a 14 year old boy who is experiencing knee pain. It gives you a lot of information about the patient and then it asks which of the following factors in this patient's history most increased his risk for developing this condition. Is it his BMI, family history, medication use, previous fractures, or recent physical activity? And you'll very quickly notice that every single question has a very similar structure. A blank year old patient comes to the office for these reasons and has these symptoms. Lots of the questions also come with images and fair warning, some of them are kind of graphic. Now step two questions look pretty similar on the surface because the question structure is almost the same, but instead of asking about basic biology concepts, these questions ask about medical knowledge and skills. Now step three, again, very similar question structure, but these are more geared towards the decision-making process in patient care. On the screen now, you can see some sample questions. Each of these three exams is out of 300 points. In 2021, the average scores were 231, 247, and 227, respectively. And these three steps have surprisingly high pass rates of 91%, 98%, and 98%, respectively. Which I guess makes sense because these students were smart enough to get into medical school in the first place. However, if you want to hear about an exam that doesn't have as high of a pass rate, look no further than the JEE, India's Engineering Entrance Exam. The JEE is required for admission to various engineering colleges in India, including the coveted IITs, the Indian Institutes of Technology. The more I looked into this exam, the more grateful I felt for not needing to take this. So the JEE consists of two parts, JEE Main and JEE Advanced. If you do well enough on the Main, you'll qualify for the Advanced, and the advanced is what you need to do well on if you want to get into the IITs. So the main consists of three papers, paper one, paper 2A, and paper 2B. Paper one is required of all candidates and test them on their knowledge of physics, math, and chemistry. 2A and 2B are optional depending on what you want to study. Each paper is a three hour exam that consists of multiple choice questions and numerical questions. Now JEE advanced on the other hand only consists of two papers. Each paper is a three hour online exam that consists of numerical questions and multiple multiple choice questions that focus on physics, math, and chemistry. So now how difficult is the JEE? 
Well, to give you some perspective, 1.5 million students take the main each year and only 10% qualify for advanced. And then of the people who take advanced, only 25% of them qualify and get into an IIT. In other words, roughly 2.5% of the original test takers. As former IIT Delhi director Ram Gopal Rao once said, the exam is tricky and complicated because it is designed to eliminate people or to reject candidates, not to select them. Let's take a look at a few sample questions just to see how tricky and complicated it truly is. First, we're gonna look at JEE Main, and right off the bat, we're dealing with integrals. And you know, as I'm looking at this, I can't help but think about the dozens of people that DM me each month saying that the SAT is nothing compared to the JEE. And now I see why. For comparison, let me show you the first math question on a practice SAT exam. What is 10% of 470? Now, to be fair, the digital SAT is adaptive, meaning the questions do get harder, but this comparison is still hilarious. Anyways, let's take a look at a couple more math questions. We have some algebra, we have some geometry, we have some probability. And actually, let's try to answer this question right here. A pair of dice is thrown five times. For each throw, a total of five is considered a success. If the probability of at least four successes is k over three to the 11th, then k is equal to what? 82, 123, 164, or 75? I actually want you to pause this video and try to solve this problem yourself. Okay, so first we have to figure out the probability of a success. That is the probability that a pair of dice sums to five. We can roll a 1 and a 4, a 2 and a 3, a 3 and a 2, or a 4 and a 1. That's four possible ways out of 36 total, meaning that our probability of success is 1 ninth, and our probability of failure is 8 ninths. Now let's call these values P and Q. Now the question is asking us about the probability of at least four successes. So in other words, the probability of four successes or five successes. And to get that value, we'll add the probability of four successes to the probability of five successes. Now to calculate those two probabilities, we have to calculate the binomial distribution formula, which I will not dive into here. But if we simply plug the numbers in, we get that the probability of at least four successes is five choose four times P to the four times Q plus five choose five times P to the fifth, which gives us 41 over three to the power of 10, which is equal to 123 over three to the power of 11, meaning that K equals 123. So the answer is two. Now we glossed over a lot of the math there, but I just wanted to show you how involved these questions can get. And that was just question number two, by the way. Now let's quickly look at some example physics problems. We're dealing with electromagnetism, digital electronics, fluid dynamics. These questions span almost every major area of physics. And same goes for the chemistry questions. Right on the first page, we have solid state chemistry, electrochemistry, organic chemistry. These questions make AP Chem seem not too bad. And before we jump onto the next exam, let me show you some JEE advanced questions as well. Like JEE main, this exam covers math, physics, and chemistry, though as expected, the questions are a lot trickier. Speaking of tricky questions, next up we have the Gaokao. Whereas the JEE is India's undergraduate admission exam, the Gaokao is China's. Held in June every year, the Gaokao is a 9-hour exam taken by 13 million high school students over the course of 2-3 to three days. The exam focuses on Chinese, math, and a foreign language, and students must choose between the arts track or the science track. The arts track will further test examinees on history, political science, and geography, whereas the science track will test them on physics, chemistry, and biology. Now what makes the Gaokao so difficult? Well, unlike the SAT, which has multiple administrations throughout the year, the Gaokao is only held once per year. Most Chinese students will only have one shot to take this exam, unless they want to delay the onset of their college education, like this 55-year-old man who has taken the Gaokao 26 times. And the scores these students receive directly influences the colleges they'll get into. Unlike in the US where we have a holistic admissions process, meaning that admissions officers will look at the whole package instead of just test scores, Chinese universities focus just on the numbers. So as expected, this exam spurs a heavy amount of stress and competition between classmates. Many students, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, see this exam as the only way to change their economic and social destiny. So how well do you need to do on the Gaokao to get into China's top universities? Well, it varies by province, because different provinces in China have slightly different administrations of the Gaokao. To get into schools like Peking, which is often touted as the Harvard of China, students in some provinces need to score in the top 1%, 
and students in other provinces need to score in the top 0.5%. So it's not a surprise that students spend years prepping for this exam. Let's look at a few sample questions. Now I'll be honest, I struggled to find the English version of this exam, so I'll start by showing you some questions in Chinese from the 2022 administration. Here we have some of the chemistry questions for students who chose the science track. Here are some of the biology questions, and here are some of the math questions. Now I actually found some translated math questions, but they come from the 2016 exam. Rest assured, they're still similar to what students see on the Gaokao today. Let's read a couple of them off. Given an arithmetic sequence, Sn is the sum of the first n terms. If a1 plus a2 squared equals negative 3, s5 equals 10, then the value of a9 is what? Another question is, in the figure below, f is the right focus of the ellipse, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1, where a is greater than b, which is greater than 0. A straight line, y equals b over 2, intersects the ellipse at points b, c, and angle b, f, c equals 90 degrees. Then the eccentricity of the ellipse is what? Now some of you may also know the Gaokao for its absurd essay prompts. Here are some prompts that showed up in previous years. In 2013, some students were given the following topic. It flies upward and a voice asks if it is tired. It says no. I'm not even joking, that is the entire prompt. Here's another one from the 2013 Beijing Gaokao. How would Thomas Alva Edison react to the mobile phone if he came to the 21st century? No less than 800 words, choose your own title. At least this one makes more sense and it sounds kind of interesting. And now I actually found a copy of the 2023 essays and used Google Translate to decipher the prompts. Here's how one of them reads. People have better control over time due to technological development, but some people become servants of time. What associations and thoughts does this sentence trigger in you? Now, if those questions blew your mind, you are not ready for what's to come because we're about to cover the All Souls Fellowship exam. I'm actually so excited to talk about this exam because it is unlike anything we've talked about so far. So for some context, the All Souls Fellowship exam is an extremely competitive and prestigious exam held by All Souls College at Oxford University. This exam was actually once deemed the hardest exam in the world. Now All Souls only has graduate students and it administers this exam to search for its examination fellows. These fellows get, and I quote, seven years of research in ideal conditions, in regular contact with leading scholars in their field, and free from many of the pressures, financial and otherwise, which can afflict graduate studies. In other words, fellows get to pursue academic research without any worry, and that too at the University of Oxford. So what does this exam look like? Well, it's 12 hours long. It consists of four papers of three hours each. Two of the papers are related to the candidate's field of study. For example, classical studies, economics, English literature, history, law, philosophy, or politics. And the other two papers are general papers, which contain questions on a wide array of topics. Let's take a look at a few. Satirizing the super rich is not art. It is shooting fish in a barrel. Discuss. Which aspects of someone's life should go into their obituary? Why? Never memorize something that you can look up. Is this good advice today? No action or speech is ever truly spontaneous. Discuss. And then finally, how can healthcare be funded? I don't think I need to explain what makes this exam so difficult. But you know what? Maybe these are just some outliers. Let's look at a couple other examples. Can objectifying another person ever be justified? Can an institution care? An eternal life would be unlivable. Discuss. How should we explain the notion of a biological species? We are all migrants through time. Discuss. You know, I feel simultaneously anxious and excited by these questions. They do seem kind of fun to answer, but at the same time, where do you even start? Oh, and by the way, years ago, this exam also used to have a one word essay. Examinees were given one word and had to write an entire essay in response. Now let me show you some of the specialist papers. Here's the classical studies question. I am honestly speechless. Uh, but you know what, let's look at some of the philosophy questions. Surely they can't be that bad. Are you a worm stretching across a region of space time? Never mind, they are that bad. Jokes aside, 150 students take this exam each year, of which the college will select two examination fellows. That's a calm 1.33%. Okay, so how does the college score these exams though? Well, they don't, or not in the sense you expect them to. Obviously, the evaluation process for these sorts of questions is very subjective and the college says so themselves. There is no single formula for gaining the fellowship. The important thing is to write scripts that show you at your best. Bear in mind that you may need to allow yourself more latitude and ambition than usual. In the fellowship examination, some risks may yield significant rewards. I'm gonna let you think about that one. Now, if you wanna hear about another exam that will absolutely screw with your mind, well, you're in luck because next up we're talking about the Putnam. I am so excited to talk about this exam because it genuinely fascinates me. 
I've honestly thought about making a separate video just for this exam. But why is it special? What makes it so exciting? Well, first of all, the Putnam is actually a competition. The full name of it is the William Lowell Putnam Mathematical Competition. Every single year, 4,000 to 5,000 of the brightest undergraduate students from the US and Canada take this exam. And it has one of the craziest statistics of any exam we've talked about today. The median score is a zero, a zero. The top five scorers are called the Putnam Fellows and receive a cash prize of $2,500. And the school with the first place team wins a cash prize of $25,000. In recent years, MIT has absolutely dominated the leaderboard. I mean, just take a look at the results from the 2022 competition. So now what does the exam look like? It lasts six hours and consists of 12 questions, each worth 10 points. These questions cover topics like algebra, combinatorics, geometry, and calculus. Now you might be wondering, Gohar, I've taken algebra. How hard can this exam really be? Well, these questions require a whole different level of mathematical intuition. Let's look at a few sample questions. Here's question A5 from the 83rd Putnam. Alice and Bob play a game on a board consisting of one row of 2,022 consecutive squares. They take turns placing tiles that cover two adjacent squares, with Alice going first. By rule, a tile must not cover a square that is already covered by another tile. The game ends when no tile can be placed according to this rule. Alice's goal is to maximize the number of uncovered squares when the game ends. Bob's goal is to minimize it. What is the greatest number of uncovered squares that Alice can ensure at the end of the game, no matter how Bob plays? At very quick glance, this question might seem a little doable. But I looked at the results, and out of the 546 top scorers, only 6 got a perfect score on this question, and 444 of them received no points. Okay, but now let's look at an easier question. It's not easy, but it's easier. Take a couple seconds to read that. Cool. 288 of the 546 top scorers got a perfect score on this. Only 82 received no points. Go ahead and take a look at a couple more examples. I think the length of these questions makes some of them deceivingly simple, but once you start working with them, they'll just mess with your mind. Now it is kind of fun to try and understand the solutions to these questions, so just in case you're interested, I'll link them in the description of this video. And with that, you can take a deep breath because we're done. Hopefully you had a fun time looking at some of the most challenging exams in the world. Let me know in the comments if you've actually taken one of these or plan to do so one day. As always, like and subscribe for more, check out next Admiral for College as to help, and I'll see you again next time.